Okay, so this is the ninth lecture. Um, we'll be focusing on winding numbers. Okay, so we'll start with the example. If gamma t is the curve a plus e to the 2 pi i n t for t between 0 and 1. So eventually you have i, you have the units that are rounded, and you will go through, go through like n cycle, right? Because 2 pi i n t, right? So eventually we'll go into cycle and this integral, if you compute it directly, right, by definition, and we use the fact that this curve is smooth, so we can just take derivative dt, and we notice that these two cancel out, which gives you 2 pi i n. Okay, so so we see how we get something. So if we, if we divide by one of two pi i, we get an integer, and this n is exactly the number of time that a circle winds around the central point a, right? So this leads to proposition four point one, which is that this thing is always an integer, for gamma between zero and one, and f is not on the curve. Okay, well let's do. This is a closed rectifiable curve, but we just we just proved that it works for for smooth curves, right? Because our interest is we're not really interested in piecewise smooth or closed rectifiable uh, curves. Our uh, focusing our focus is on like smooth curves. Okay, so we're not really interested. I mean, for me though, it's like even though you can prove for uh, piecewise smooth, and then you can use the fact that for any closed curve, right, you can find a what pol polygonal path such that they differ by epsilon, right? So you can use this lemma by proving that well this is piecewise smooth. So you can prove that piecewise smooth works. And then you can prove that for any rectifiable we have this and we can just deduce our result. But I'm just straight up lazy, and let's just develop our uh, result for smooth curves, okay, shall we? Okay, so the proof is that while well, we consider gamma to be smooth, okay, we define g to, to c by define gt is equal to the upper bound so s minus a okay so what observations okay let me just let's make it down a bit a bit down more okay so let's define gt to be this. And we can observe that g0 is equal to 0, right? And g1 is equal to 1 over gamma of, right? Because g1, right, g1, this is 1. Well, this thing is really just by definition because it's smooth. We can multiply the derivative, well, which is basically this thing, right? And we also have that g prime t is equal to minus a, right, for t between 0 and 1. Right? So this is by the fundamental theorem of calculus. Well, why? Because we have our input to be real input, and our output is like a complex value function. So we can just prove that well. It works for the both real and com imaginary part. So we can conclude this also works, okay? Because the text was like just it just assumes that you know the complex version of fundamental theorem algebra and. I guess like this is what it means, right? So now because gamma t is continuous, okay, 
continuous. And A is not an image, right? Well, this is because gamma prime t is continuous. Because this is continuous, the thing is, if the inner function must be continuous in order to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Because this gamma t is continuous. And A is not, so this, this term will never vanish, right? But we have, well, if we take this function, now this by product rule times gamma prime minus g prime e negative g of gamma minus a well this gives you e to the negative g of gamma prime minus so g prime multiplied by this which is just multiplied by this gives you gamma prime g back again right which is zero okay so this is a constant function right so this is a constant function which means that which means that well which means that e to the negative g zero gamma zero minus a right should be equal to g one gamma one minus a right you agree with me yeah so but notice that y0 is equal to y1 because we assume that it's a closed curve right it's a closed curve which means that e to the g1 minus g0 which is e to the g1 is equal to 1 which means that g1 is equal to um 2 pi i times something k right where k is an integer hmm? yeah well because g1 what is g1 well g1 is just the integral we want right so so this proves the proposition. Well, so after we prove that, well, this integral, the for this integral is always integer, the definition is well defined. If the closed curve in C, then we define this, right? Because, well, this is 2 pi i k. So we divide by 1 over 2 pi i, right? So it's, it's an integer. This thing is an integer, right? We define this thing, the integer, to be denoted as this. It's called an index of gamma with respect to the point A. But usually we also call this the winding number of gamma around A. Okay? Winding number of gamma around A. Oh, I just wrote it down. Yeah, it's a winding number of gamma around A. Okay? And here's some note, is that, well, gamma t is equal to this, as given at the beginning, then the winding number of n at a is really just n, right? Okay, but here we have a theorem. Well, this theorem states that, well, if it's a closed curve, then the winding number is constant for a belonging to a component of this set. So we, right, so we want to define a winding number, so we have to consider this set, right? But this is a constant for A belonging to a component of G, and also is zero for belonging to the unbounded component of G, okay? So, first, um, first I'll show that G, has exactly one component. 
for those who don't know what is a component, um, you could go to you could you could go to my um first lecture about the definition of component, connected components. Okay. Okay, so we first show that you have exactly one unbounded component. So this next thing becomes very topological, right? Well, okay, so let's just start. Well, because gamma is compact, right? Because you're continuous, which means that you're bounded, right? Which means that there exists a ball. There's a ball, right? Such that and you're contained in the ball, right? Now, for with this means that the complement is in the complement of the trace, which is by definition equal to G, right? And you know that SC is what connected, right? We know that it is connected. If you're connected, then U lives inside exactly one component of. Right, you should be living in exactly one component of G. Okay, so for this, if this is not clear, well, refer refer to Munker's topology. Well, Munker's topology. Topology. Chapter um, Okay, let me just um, Section 25 Theorem 25.1 Okay, so here's the reference um, This car, okay, so here's the reference Okay. You must be lying exactly one component. So, if you're lying exactly one component, which means that all other component of G, well, it should be intersect as complement. It should give you the empty set because they're disjoint, right? Because components are a partition. Well, if you live in one component, then all the other components intersect SZ, which is subset of all the components intersecting the component, which is equal to zero, uh, empty set because they're disjoint, right? All the components are disjoint. If they form a partition of the set. Well, which means that this means that if you intersect the complement of this gives you zero, well, basically, this means that you're in S, which means that you're bounded, right? So you have exactly one component that is unbounded. Or you have exactly one unbounded component. So this proves the result, what we want, okay? All right, so before, okay, so we have done our thing, and now is, uh, here's the actual proof. Here's the actual proof. Mm, well, if we define f from g, integer be the map be the map defined by we define this to be by fa is 
the winding number of gamma a. So for each a, right, we just give we just gives you back the winding number. It's a, it's a natural thing to do, right? Well, all we have is that if we can show that if f is continuous, then for component d of g since you're continuous which means that you're connected but you map into the integers which means that f is constant on d which is exactly what we want right which is exactly what we want so the only thing remaining to show is that f is continuous. Okay. So we want to show that f is continuous. Well, first, we fix a point A and G. Okay. And we let R to be the distance between A and a trace. Okay, so what do we make such definition? Well, if, if we have a minus b less than delta less than 1 over 2r, this means that for points on a trace, we first, we have that then minus a greater or equal to r greater than 1 over 2r. And secondly, we have then minus b is greater or equal to the distance of um, b and a trace, right, by definition. Well, this is greater than r minus b minus a. Uh, let me mark this by mark it by um, by one. So this is not this. I'm pretty sure this is not clear for most of you guys. I'll explain. I'll come back to here later. Greater than r minus delta, which is greater than one over two r. Okay. So why is this true? Because delta is less than one over two r. Okay, so r minus delta greater than r minus 1 over 2r, which is 1 over 2r, okay? Now, so d, we have to emphasize this inequality. Let me just make it larger, okay? Okay, let me just explain why. Why 1? Okay, so this is because, well, d of, d of a, this, uh, minus a minus b, right, is less than or equal to some a minus Z minus A minus B, right? Because this is an infimum, so for any point on the on a trace, right? Well, this is again less than B minus Z, right? Because if we move it back over there, it's a triangle inequality, right? Well, which means that this this series and lower bound of all this, right? Which means that if this serves as a lower bound, then you must be not greater than 
the enfema. Right? So this this thing is really hard. Right? So I hope this explains so this is greater equal to R minus it's a metric, so it doesn't matter, right? Okay. So we have this. Okay. Now what we gonna do now is uh, we wanna estimate F A minus F B. So finally we're gonna estimate, right? So it's gonna be one over two pi times gamma of one over z minus a minus minus b dz. Okay. Well this is you do the algebra here, right? You just combine a common denominator, I mean common factor, or whatever you said, whatever it's called, I forgot. And you can put this out times gamma 1 over z minus a, z minus b, dz. Okay? And now we observe that this is less than what we use uh, less than equal to a minus b 2 pi times the total variation times the supremum of this thing um, or I mean it's essentially the absolute value of this thing right so it's is taken on the trace of the curve okay so this is a standard estimation but by no by one and two right this thing is less than we have a minus b Okay, we have a minus b is less than delta here. And this is a constant, we keep it. And z minus a. Well, z minus a is greater than this. So we flip it, it's less than or equal to r over 2. No, 2 over r, right? Right? And also, this thing is greater than 1. So we do the same thing, right? Which means that. Well, which means that, well, we see that r, no, 4 over r squared is an upper bound for this, right? So the supremum must be less than or equal to the upper bound, right? So we have this is less than delta 2 pi 4 r squared v gamma, which is a constant times some delta. Right, a constant times in delta, and sorry, mate, I have to move you. Okay, sorry, mate. Okay, so we have this. We have our estimation here. Right. Okay, so with this estimation. With this estimation, we know that for any epsilon greater than zero, pick what? Pick delta less than epsilon over c, right? Then we have for a minus b less than delta. We have F A minus F B, which is less than epsilon, right? Less than delta, less than epsilon. 
Okay, so which means that f is continuous a. But a is arbitrary. Right, so f is continuous on g, right? f is continuous on g. Right. So this is a fancy estimation there. All right. And now we also, as we discuss, we can pick u and unbounded component of g. Okay, we pick u to be an unbounded component of g. It's the only one, right? So if it's the only unbounded component g, we can pick an r such that the set z all their norms greater than r. So it's like the space, right? The space is contained in u. Well, this is because u is the only unbounded component. It's the only unbounded component, right? Because as we discussed before, all the components of G, all other components of G must be bounded. Right, so you can pick a bound such that all, all the components of G, right, lies in there. But the rest is U's territory. You know what I'm saying? Right? The rest is U's territory. So we can pick an R such that this is in U. Well, with that being said, what can we say that for now? Like, okay, we have we have this construction. Mm -hmm. We want to see that. Well, we we want to prove that the winding number is zero, right? So for W on the curve, right, and. For epsilon greater than zero, we pick A such that and it's greater than two pi epsilon times V of gamma. Okay, so what we can get for this? Then we have the winding number of gamma at A which is um, you know, by direct computation, right? Just compute directly, which is, uh, why, was, why number is this, right? So this, let me just copy this. Let's go to this, right? It's the absolute value of this. Which is less than equal to one over two pi times this times the supremum of zen minus a. I mean, I'm so sorry. It should be w. Right? It should all be w. I mean, well, it doesn't matter right now. It's just zen minus a for z on the curve. But we picked A such that for all W we have this is true, right? So if you flip it, it's less than or equal to this over 1. So this serves an upper bound for a set of all this, which means that this thing is greater than or equal to the supreme, right? Which is less than or equal to 1 over 2 pi V gamma times 2 pi epsilon gamma, which is equal to epsilon, right? 
So we have this should be less than epsilon, but this is an integer, right? Which means that if epsilon equals to one over two, then we know that it's less than one over two, which means that the winding number gamma a should be zero. And this for all a and u, right? Because because you're a constant on a component. Right? So this proves the theorem. Okay? Well, here's a note. Okay, so so again, we're back to our classic um, example. Well, then by the theorem we've proven, the winding of gamma and b is n if b is in a circle, right? Radius one. If you're in a circle, then the winding number is n because the winding number at a is equal to n. And if b is in the ball, like they both belong to the same component, which is the ball itself. But outside the ball, your winding number is equal to zero. Right? So this really explains like if you have a point here, B, then this is your curve. Like it winds this number zero times. Right? Okay, so this prepares the knowledge for winding numbers. And I'll see you guys next time.